If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask that you turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Revelation 19. In the first verse, the Bible says, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and have avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And, great, and a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as a voice of many waters, and a voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care to our church. Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, we praise you for bringing us safe this far, Lord, in our life and in our testimony to you. Lord, we pray that you would grant us uh, many years of being able to serve you. Lord, we pray that you would bless this church, that you would bind us closer together, Lord, that we might be just simply as a unit that works together. Lord, we pray for the lost that meet among us, that this might be the day of true salvation to them. Lord, that you might open their heart. Lord, that you might make them new, and that you draw them to yourself. By mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Now, uh, I'm going to be preaching this morning on how do you worship? How do I worship? Uh, what really, really brings praise to our Lord? And it's really been a, a, a real focus of mine lately, and the Lord seemingly brings me again and again to different scriptures where all they did was praise the Lord. Now, in the seven verses that I read this morning, four separate times, they make the statement, Alleluia! Now, in our culture and in the modern day, you often hear the word, Hallelujah. Yeah. That is not in the Bible. It never occurs in our King James Bible. Nothing necessarily wrong with it. It does mean praise. But the Bible says, Hallelujah. Now, the meaning of that word simply means it notes praise, joy, and exhortation. Praise meaning lifting up the name of Jesus, joy, and I'm fearful we don't have enough of that to even prompt us to say, Hallelujah. Uh, I'm fearful that that may be the keynote of our problem uh, as a people in the modern day. And then it says an exhortation. Now, to, uh, to exhort something or somebody is to lift them up. Uh, having to say, you're better than I am. You're more knowledgeable than I am. You are, are far beyond my strength, so I praise you for who you are. Now, that is where we're at. Now that, and, and you know, that's where we need to assume our position this morning. First of all, if you want to really praise Him, you really need to recognize how small and beggarly you really are. And I believe if we get down there to that point and get our pride set aside, that hallelujah will come a lot easier. That praise would be a, a, a more easy thing for us to do. And because I think the reason that our type of people don't do it, really, and we'll say, well, that's not biblical. Well, it must be because it's here. Uh, I, I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes to our pride. I think it goes to, uh, well, we're right, and we don't have to do that, so let's forget about it. So, I want you to see the, after these things in the first verse, after the judgment of the great whore, and all that's attached to her, after those things, that's what that verse means, after this judgment, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Now, uh, in this flesh, there is no way 
for you to be proud, or I guess pride is the wrong word, to be joyful is a better word after seeing such a judgment that comes on the people. Now, I understand the great whore is the Catholic Church and all her daughter churches. I understand that. But now, what makes me have some compassion is this. What's a church made out of? People. People. Uh, in my own mind's eye, it's very hard for me to rejoice in this present flesh about someone being cast into hell. Because the misery of that place, we can't even comprehend. We, we can't, you know, we can't get comprehend the, uh, the great glories of heaven. And listen, there's no way for us to even get a hold of, of a little bit of the misery of hell. And, and, and yeah, I understand all, uh, the Pope and all those filthy, ungodly card, cardinals. I understand where they're at. But there's a measure of me that says, you know, I hate to see anybody yeah. split hell wide open. Yeah. But one day, when that occurs, because this flesh will be set aside, I'll say, hallelujah, praise be to God. I'm glad to see them go. They got just what they deserved. And, and be able to be genuine in that. I'll say, hallelujah. Pray, because you know what? Because evil is going to be put under him. Now, if we be honest right now, we're not quite to that point. Now, there might be some of them, you know, if you can see, uh, if you think the Pope being dethroned, and if you don't think he's sitting on the throne, you're crazy. Uh, he, he has his throne. And see him dismantled a little bit, I, I'd probably be happy. But again, we're talking about a, an unbelievable, unnumerable amount of people cast alive into hell. And, and, and so we see then that one thing that we must have, if we're going to say, hallelujah, is a spirit mind and not a carnal mind. And another thing, understanding and knowing what God says and what God does is far better than what we can think or say. And the voice, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, they named five separate things that they praise Him for. And the first one, I don't know that I can identify with all of them, but I certainly can identify with salvation. He saved my never dying soul. And if nothing else, on that one understanding, I can say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Blessed be the name of the Lord because He did something for me that I could not do for myself. He prevented me. He, he intervened on my behalf so I wouldn't have to endure the miseries of hell. And you know what? What's blessed and wonderful about that to me is He didn't have to. It wasn't required of Him. He did it by His goodness and by His grace and by His mercy. And so that's one part of this, this praise that I can identify with, certainly. And then He says, uh, salvation and glory. Glory is light, just lightened up outside just a few minutes ago. You can see better. It, it, it encourages your heart. We want to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Shine on Him so that others may see. And then He says, an honor. Do you honor Him? And, and if you say yes, how do you honor Him? What do you do? What do you do to honor the Lord God on an everyday basis. Well, if, if you come here, that's somewhat honoring. But as the years go by, I see more and more that's for myself. And, and not that I want to vote. This is where I get refueled. This, this is where I get boosted up so I can go for another week. The, 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 this is much for my, uh, my doctrinal benefit as it is for any other thing. So what do you do? What do you do to honor Him? Well, uh, I'll give you this. If you're going to honor Him, give Him your life. Give Him it all. Give Him everything you've got. 
from the beginning to the end. You know what? We, and the older I get, get to be 48 tomorrow if I live that long. The older I get, the more I realize is this. I don't own anything. I, and it really doesn't matter to me. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I praise the Lord. He's given me a place to stay. But it's not mine. And, and not being ugly, but a lot of my black friends, uh, they never really say they live anywhere. They say I stay. And you know what? That's a, there's a lot of truth in that. And the reason they started saying I stays here and I stays there is from their slavery days, they owned nothing. Yeah. And they knew they owned nothing. So if the master says, you go over there, that's where they slept tonight. And on the next night, if he says, I want you down there, that's where he went. That's where they stayed. They didn't live anywhere. And, and that's where we need to be. I stays here for the moment. He's given me a good place to live. But you know what? If tonight, one of those sweeping winds that went through here last night, if it took my house and made nothing out of it, all I could say is, blessed be the name of the Lord. A lot of people say, well, I don't understand how Job did what he did. Well, I understand it because Job had an understanding that it wasn't his to start with. That it wasn't here, so he blessed the Lord for the time that he did have it. And so we ought to be with our lives, with everything that we got, our ability, that's what we should praise the Lord with. And power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. And we've already touched on that, to be able to say, yeah, she deserved it, it is, a, is a spiritual gift. And righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and have avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, I'll interject here concerning the great whore. If you boil the water off, all that her daughters do is works for salvation. From the great whore down to the most recent edition, all it is is works. Works, works. And you say, well, what's wrong with good works? Well, nothing's wrong with good works. James said, uh, you show me your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. But the faith does come first. Grace is necessary. You know what? You know, you know why I preach the gospel? Simply for Him Nothing more, nothing less. That, that, that's, that, that, that is a work, but I don't, don't do it for any merit. These people that have a works-based salvation, they're doing it for merit and saying, Hey, I deserve that. I'm saved because I did this, this, and this. He saved me and I kept it because of this, this, and this. Where does the merit go? It goes to them. And, and, and the great whore started that many, many, many years ago. And she's added to and, and, and took a little from here and a little from there. And this season that the whole United States is fixing to go after, hook, line, and sinker is nothing more than an outgrowth of that horse woman. And you can take it apart bit by bit and every one of them attach her to who she is. And so, in that day, we'll be able to praise Him for that. Verse 3. And again, they said, Hallelujah! Now, there's not one of us in this building. And understand, the Bible says very clearly, the woman is to be silent. But that, that brings it down to us men, does it not? How many of you have ever said, Hallelujah! And not one of us has. I mean, if I'm wrong, tell me. I haven't known Brother Ashley all my life. He may have, he may have done that in one of the East Kentucky churches. But the rest of us I've known pretty much all my life. Sat in church with you for 30 years. And not being critical because I haven't said it either. But I think what it gets down to is why haven't we? 
Not that we have historically, but why haven't we? Why couldn't we find it in ourselves when we have this sovereign, mighty God accomplishing things every day that He doesn't deserve our praise? I, I can't comprehend that. And again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing one because I don't do it enough either. But I think what really is the reason we don't gets back to pride. Was that not Job's problem? I think it was. And, and, and so we see then that we as the Lord's people, and then in that time as the Lord's people, will rejoice over His great and, and, and accurate judgment. Notice it kind of spreads in verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God and that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see they did two things. Number one, that amen. And I have heard that in this church, and I enjoy hearing amen. And, and all, you know what that means, right? I agree. That's what amen means. So what is the difference between amen and hallelujah? Amen just says that you're agreeing with me, right? Or if uh, Brother Downs is preaching, or, or if, if uh, Brother uh, Trescott is preaching, or whomever, that you're saying, yeah, I agree with that. But, hallelujah, gives praise to Him. You see the difference? And so, the, the, these four and twenty elders were saying, I agree. And remember, the one that is telling of this is God Himself. I agree with you, God, and I give praise to you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And so they were saying, I fully agree. I also want you to see their position of laying flat. And I think that's very important as well. Verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, now, what is in the throne? The Godhead, right? Now, I personally believe all three persons of the Godhead will be back on the throne in that day. The Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father is specifically described. And I believe the Holy Ghost will withdraw Himself from this place during the seven year tribulation. That's my own opinion. And so I have to, if he's not here, he has to be there, right? Because when the Lord Jesus was here, the Holy Ghost was there. And, and I, I say that by this, he said, I will send you a comforter. And, and so I have to say, if he was going to send him a comforter, at that point, the comforter had to be somewhere else. It only makes sense, right? And, and so I feel like the Holy Ghost will be back in glory, and they will be there as a, as a, as a triune God, and receiving praise. Now from that entity. This command comes out. Praise our God. All ye servants. Ye, ye that fear him. Both small and great. Now I want you to see. The command is this. Praise him. Praise him. Ye servants. Now we don't understand servants like we should. But a servant is this. If I said, get up and bring me a glass of water. Immediately, they get up, go get me a glass of water, bring it to me and hand it to me. That is a servant. So, he's saying, praise. And you know what? He expects you to do it. Right? He, he, he you know, he gives you the command. He is our lead officer. He's our commander in chief. He is the one that's there. And he says, praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, and saying, Hallelujah! For the God omnipotent reigneth. Now I want you to see what, how, how is verse 5 and verse 6 connected. Well 5 he's given a command and in 6 they follow through. You see how that goes? They're not separate entities. They're tied to the one to the other. 
by God saying, you praise me. And in verse 6, they do exactly what he says. You know, what, what a wonderful thing it would be this morning if God commanded us and we followed through immediately. Now, I know what you're thinking right now because I'm already thinking it myself. Well, in that place, in that time, the flesh is set aside. Well, let me say this to you. That's no excuse. Now, we grab onto it a whole lot, do we not? But that's no excuse. And so, we find from this that certainly our Lord does deserve great praise. We'll read verse 7 and finish up. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. Two things. We're to be glad, we're to rejoice, and those things together will give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. So we find that worship is very, very exclusive. In fact, as you come into the auditorium, the the, the thing above your head, if you've ever word, read it, says, enter to worship. If you see, uh, most, uh, and I, I think it's on our sign too, it says worship hour. And it says 11 o'clock on ours, right? Most people, and ours may actually say this, preaching at 11. Now, if we're not going to worship, the latter is more accurate, is it not? If I get up here and proclaim the truth, that is preaching. Now, to worship is to be in unity and as a unit give Him praise and glory and honor that's due His dear name. That is worshiping and there's a huge difference. Singing is attached to worship. Saying, Hallelujah, is attached to worship. Sitting and doing nothing is not attached to worship. Is it good listening skill? Yeah. Can you learn from that? You know, I can't, I can't even remember how many times Betty Bourne said, You sit there, Larry, and be still. And she was trying to get, well, she's the main lady. I say that in my defense. But she's trying to get me to sit still and listen. And you know what? I learned to sit still and listen. I'm sure my latter teachers appreciated her work. And there's nothing wrong with that. But don't identify as worship. You see what I'm saying? It is not the same. One is to learn. And one is to worship. And so we find that that connected to worship is to give Him praise and, and give Him glory and give Him great and wonderful honor. Now, go with me very quickly in just a couple places I want to read in the Revelation. And then we're going to go back to one other place. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. Most of you know it by heart. The four and twenty elders, again those individuals that we also see in Revelation 19. The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast, and cast their crowns before Him saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So we find this very same group of people. Now, I don't know who these 24 men are. A lot of people have different ideas. Some say that they were the 12 apostles and, some, uh, and the 12 tribe heads. Maybe, but I have a little issue with it. Because the Bible says that one of, one of the apostles was the devil. And then you have to replace someone real for him. So was it Matthias or was it Paul? Or was it both? That, that's just extra thought for this week. And some people say the other, uh, the other tribe heads are the other twelve. Well, you know what? That bunch was corrupt too. They, they sold their brother into slavery. 
You, you think they deserve, do you think they deserve something great because they did that? So I'm not sure, but whoever these 24 uh, individuals are, they knew how to praise God and they sat there and when the Lord illustrated Himself, manifested Himself, they took their crowns off and said, Hallelujah! They, they were very excited and very praiseful for just being in the presence of God. And that's what we ought to be. Is very praiseful when we're in the presence of God. Now drop down to uh, chapter 5 and verse 14. Chapter 5 and verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. I agree. Amen. And then they fell down. And so we see that this praise is always connecting, connected to putting the flesh right where it belongs. And it belongs right here. It belongs right here. On the ground, in the floor, where it deserves to be. And uh, you know what? I believe if we had that mentality that we would be a lot better off. And a lot of people say, and I understand, my knees are shot too. I've had a lot of help with that lately. And I give the Lord the praise for that. And they say, well, that's just tip, type, uh, a type. Well, be careful what you type out. Because very quickly, God will be no more than a type. Now, if you can't get down on the floor, get as low as you can. Does that make sense? You get as near down there. Because remember, this is after, uh, you can't say that was Old Testament because this is actually future events that have not even occurred yet. So we need to be a base for our Lord to be lifted up. We need to be brought low if the Lord is to be uh, lifted up on high. You know, uh, your plans and your ideas mean next to nothing. Have you ever thought about that? If we really abase ourselves like we should, your big plan, your big ideas about how things ought to go mean nothing. That's why I say you give yourself to God. You know, uh, that's all you have. What, whatever few years that we have, that we've been granted a life in this place and in this time, that's all that you have to impact others for Christ. Very brief, very brief time. Gone in a moment. And then it's over with. Whatever opportunity that you had that you did not utilize... It's gone. Now, never to be regained. Never to be brought back. Never, never to be able to be relived. Now, go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. <clears throat> and we're going to read about a very familiar uh, encounter uh, with a woman. The Lord had an encounter with a half-breed Jew. And they were Samaritans. Now, if you're saved this morning, I'll be the first to tell you you're a half-breed. You're half-spiritual and you're half-flesh. You're a half-breed. And I believe that's what's so miraculous about the, the, the information concerning the Samaritan woman is that we fall into that group. I still deal with this flesh. I still deal with the... Con no, and, and certainly we should see the sinfulness and the ugliness of this flesh. But I also see the confinement of this flesh. You know what? Because of money and because of health, I just can't get up and take off anytime I want to to the far side of the world to preach the glorious gospel of Christ. I'm still half flesh. And the sinfulness, yes, that's a, that's a piece of it. The decay, yeah, that's a piece of it. But the flesh is a problem all the way around. 
And so we see with this fleshliness that, that we endure, we are as much of a half-breed as the Samaritan woman. Our spirit man, the one that dwells within, desires the things of God. Now let me say this, and if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. If you don't at least have a little inkling to follow after Christ, you're probably still lost. Because if you're saved, that spirit man does want spiritual things. In fact, if it's where it needs to be, it craves spiritual things. Just like, just like we crave our favorite food, we want it. And when we get around it, you know what? We gobble it up because it's what we want. It's what we desire. It's, it's, what, it's good. And so if you have no inkling... For spiritual things, do not blame anybody but yourself. And better advice is this, make your calling and election sure. Because you may not have what you think you do. We ought to crave the things of God. So with those, those two facets, those two things that makes me and you and everyone else here that is redeemed a half-breed, we'll, we'll begin to look at these scriptures. Now, this Samaritan woman answers the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you know, if you know your Bible, they had already had a lengthy discussion. The Lord Jesus was sitting on the well and his apostles, he'd sent them off to go get some bread and food for the night. And he, and he, says, to, and he says to this woman, give me the drink. And she begins this long conversation. Who are you asking me for something to drink? Now that seems like a very short, quick answer. But many times... When he says, go speak the gospel, our immediate reaction is no. And you say what you will, but that, that, that is the, ra the raising of the flesh. I'm not going to do that. Who are you to ask me something? Right? And, and so we see then, the Samaritan woman, her flesh rises up immediately. And, and then they have this, uh, this discourse for a few minutes. And he says, go call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. He says back to her, you've well said you have no husbands, because, husband because you've had five husbands. In fact, he says you have five husbands. And the one whom thou hast with now is not thy husband, and that thou hast well said. See, when we approach the throne of grace, if we're going to worship he knows you inside and out already. He knows if you're lying. He knows if you're faking. He knows if you're cold. He knows if you're hot. He knows it all. And you know what? Sometimes I stand with that thinking and it scares me. You know, what have I have found is things become habit. Good and bad. Before I, I knew the truth, my hair was a lot longer. I wore short breeches a whole lot. And you know why? They were cooler. And you know what, what, that, what that in and of itself is? It satisfies the flesh. It satisfies the flesh. Now, here I am almost 30 years later, and I wouldn't dream about exposing myself that way, but is it habit now? You see what I'm saying? Do I do it for the praise and the glory of God, or is it because for 28 years I didn't I haven't I've never I've not wore shorts. And I didn't have a pair if I wanted to wear them. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? When does praisefulness become habit? And, and we need to be very careful of that because a lot of things we do, I'm fearful, is just habit. We get up and come on Sunday because it's habit. We put on the same garment because it's happy. I mean habit. We say the same things just because it's habit. 
It's just because we <laughs> almost have gotten into a rut. So the Lord knows that about you as the Lord knew the Samaritan woman's spiritual situation. So in verse 20, she says to our Lord, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, when she begins her little discourse with the Lord Jesus and he's fixing to set things straight, she picked out their differences. You see that? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. We're just different. And she almost tried to create an argument with him. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and we do that to some extent all the time, do we not? And I don't mean with others, I think we do at times do that with others. But we create arguments with the Lord God. We, we create arguments with the Holy Ghost. And say, you know what? I'm just not going to do it. I just don't believe it that way. Uh, I've always done it this other way. And I'm going to continue doing it this other way. And I really don't care what the Bible has to say about it. I'm doing it my way. You can have your way. That was, that was really what the Samaritan woman was saying. And again, she was trying to pick a fight with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll see how she, the Lord answers him. And Jesus says unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now that seems not really related to our, our message this morning, but it very much is. Because that says we don't have to go to anywhere specific to worship God. Now let me qualify that because some people will run off a ride with it. When I say that, I don't mean, I mean this. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go to a temple. We, we can do it right here in the, in the hills of Tennessee because it's not necessary to do that. Now, with that said, let me also say this. Irregardless of many times you've heard this foolish, I can worship God just as well on the creek, creek bank as in the house of God. Not on the Lord's day, you can't. Because the Bible says, For shake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. See, the Lord has a day, and God Jehovah had a day, and for all the Messianic Jews out there, they are different. See, the, God Jehovah's day was, was the last day of the week. It was Saturday. He made all of creation, and on Saturday He rested. But the Lord Jesus Christ was risen on the first day of the week. All three times He initially met with them was on the first day of the week. And then we find again that apostle who, who leaned tenderly on the Lord's breast and said, Is it I? Meeting with the Lord, He says on the Lord's day. And, and so with, with that said, we, uh, we find that worship is integral. If we are to be the Lord's people, we have to lift Him up. We have to give Him praise. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. Now, if you underline in your Bible, get that one down. Because, see, the problem with the Samaritan woman was this. Was she worshiping? Yes. I believe she still went to the mountain. I believe even in her filthiness of her sin, uh, divorced five separate times and shacked up now. I believe she was going there. And he said, the problem is this. You don't know who you're worshiping. And the problem is this today. Many, many supposed Christians do not know who they're worshiping. They come, they go through a routine. Some of them have beautiful voices. Some of them say, Amen! But they 
worship whom they know not. You see what I'm saying? And, and so we see that the Samaritan woman was going through her routine and she was offering something, but it wasn't worship. You worship, you know not what. You know what? <laughs> we know that we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now again, the Father is looking for worship. And He's looking for individuals that are willing and want to do it. And I guess it comes down to this. Do you want to worship Him or not? Now ladies, I understand the stuff about being silent in the assembly. But you can sing. Had a lot of la sometimes I think the lot the ladies nod more than the amens I get out of the men. That's good. You can honor him in all that you do. We need to worship him. Listen, if you can sing, sing with everything you've got. Because the Lord can't take it from you. If you keep it to yourself, He can take it from you. Because if you're not going to worship Him with it, what good is it to Him anyway? Right? And so we see then, we as the Lord's people, it ought to be our heart's desire on top of everything else to worship the Lord and give Him praise. So I ask you this morning, are you doing that? And if not, what's keeping you from it?